Um, so thank you, Dr. Perry. My name is Mustafa Ramadan. I will be talking to you all about my systematic review, which is on parental glyphosate exposure on developmental malformations and neurodevelopmental effects in children. Uh, so briefly, as Dr. Perry mentioned, I am interested in toxicology, and that kind of began back in my undergrad career when I was heavily invested in the mechanistic sciences. I uh, really wanted to know about like the intermediary steps between the cause and effect. And then from there, actually, I went on to have my practicum this past summer at the Health Environmental Science Institute, uh, where I worked with the toxicologist, and I looked at dietary risk associated with a specific class of pesticides known as conazole fungicides. Uh, so from there, we started the class this past fall, and I was like, oh, what can I do? Uh, so I was thinking about what is like the most widely used pesticide in the world today, and that is kind of where I got to glyphosate. So glyphosate is also known as Roundup. What's actually funny is this past Saturday I was at Costco and on the left hand side, right when you enter, you know, there are all those featured items. So Roundup is actually there. I was like, oh, I'll be talking about you on Monday. Um, <laughs> but the sole function of glyphosate is actually to control weeds and grasses. Uh, it was implemented back in 1974 and to this day, like I mentioned, it is the most widely used pesticide in the world today. So if I ever bring up, you know, 1071, 836, so I'm talking about the exposure that's just for today. Um, so some recent controversy, as Dr. Gray mentioned, is that uh, between two credible organizations, IARC as well as the EFSA, IARC is the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and the EFSA is the European Food Safety Authority. So these two organizations have been going back and forth as to whether or not it is carcinogenic. Um, ultimately, IARC decided that it was a Group 2A carcinogen, uh, meaning that it is probably carcinogenic to humans. So this was kind of just like some a little caveat as from, from my systematic review, just some, some nice little news about whether it's carcinogenic or not. So just think about that. Um, when thinking about who was most at risk with glyphosate exposure, that kind of led me to think about occupational exposure. Uh, so a lot about you know pesticide applicators on farms and agricultural fields. However, I didn't really want to look at the adult exposure and the effects associated with them, but more so if there was that link to children. Uh, we talk a lot about in Dr. Gray's class, um, it was that A to D ratio. A to D being you know, that adult to developmental ratio. So I was thinking a lot about if uh, an adult took in a dose, whether there would be an exacerbated effect in the developing fetus. Um, we know a lot from other pesticide research that there are negative birth outcomes. A couple of statistics. I just didn't want to memorize all of them. Um, but the CDC reports that you know three to six percent of infants worldwide are born with a birth defect. Uh, in the U.S., there are one in every 33 infants have a birth defect, and also it is a leading cause of death among infants at about 20 percent. The WHO also reports that 303,000 newborns every year have a birth defect. Um, and just kind of delving in a little deeper into that uh, negative birth outcome, so looking at neurodevelopmental neurodevelopmental effects, things like uh, neural tube defects. Uh, autism, uh, ADHD, uh, these, uh, EPA reports that 15% of infants have, have that in the U.S. today. So I then developed my PICO statement, uh, the participants were humans, the exposure was the maternal or paternal exposure to glyphosate uh, among pesticide applicators, the comparative group would then be humans not exposed to glyphosate, and the outcome was then clinical diagnosis of infants born with a developmental malformation or a neural developmental effect. And just to define what those two outcomes mean for the case of the systematic review, uh, developmental malformation as part of the systematic review was any birth defect that, that was not related to a neural developmental effect. And then obviously a neural effect is that. Um, as mentioned by all of my peers, here's the methodology that we utilize for the systematic review as uh, part of the uh, navigation guide framework. The search strategy that I utilized, uh, I looked at two databases, PubMed and Scopus. This was done back on 10-10-2017. Uh, here are all the inclusion criteria. I don't want to really bore you guys to death. But basically, all the inclusion criteria had to be a part of the title, abstract, or keyword part uh, section of any study. Ultimately, a total of 399 studies were were. were popped up as, as the initial hit after duplicates were excluded. Then I had to go on and go with my primary screening, aka looking at your title and abstract. Uh, so the biggest exclusion criteria when, when parsing out through those um, studies was determining whether or not glyphosate was assessed individually or as part of a class of pesticides. So the majority of these studies when looking at, you know, I, I went through 
399 studies to get to 80. So the majority of those studies actually assessed glyphosate as part of a class of pesticides. So, so they were just looking at classes of pesticides, so things like organic chlorines, organophosphates, carbamates, herbicides. Uh, there wasn't really a way for me to distinguish the sole effect of glyphosate on the outcomes of concern, so I had to ultimately exclude all of those criteria, uh, all of those studies. So from there, from my 80 studies, eventually I came out with six of them. Here are the six included studies. You may think I can't do any math because it looks like there are seven. But ultimately, <laughs> the last study on both of these outcomes are actually the same study. They, it was really interesting because the Yang et al. study was able to look at both outcomes of concern, so that was pretty cool. Um, the bold is, is looking at the, the specific outcome of concern, so I'm just going to run through them. We have any congenital malformation, gastroschisis, lung, cleft lip, and cleft palate. Those are oral facial defects. And then you have on the neurodevelopmental effects side, ADD and ADHD, neural tube defects, as well as anencephaly and spina bifida. Uh, anencephaly and spina bifida are also both neural tube defects. A couple of key features that I was able to come out uh, with these studies was when they were published. So back, uh, the developmental malformation studies, all four of them, they were published from 1998 to 2014, while from the neurodevelopmental effects side, they were published from 2002 to 2014. So the only thing I really want to say is the fact that nothing has really been published since 2014 assessing glyphosate as an individual exposure. Here's my table one. I expect you all to read through this. Just kidding, no, no. Um, but I kind of divided it up into the outcomes of concern. So the red arrows indicate these studies uh, associated with the outcome. <clears throat> and the red boxes is kind of where I want to lead your guys' eyes towards. The left red box is looking at study participants as well as the cases from glyphosate. You'll notice that there is a dramatic difference in the numbers. This is because of the fact that out of actually all six studies, um, they did not just assess glyphosate as the only exposure. Uh, obviously, there were all, all the pesticides that were assessed were individually assessed. However, there were a variety of pesticides being assessed. So that is why there is a only small percentage uh, coming from glyphosate. Also, I want to lead you to the exposure matrix side. You'll notice that things like questionnaires, forms, and GIS geocoding were, were utilized. Here's a quick snapshot of one of those developmental malformation studies. It's from the Shaw et al. study. It was a case control study with 30 cases associated with glyphosate. This image here shows a picture of an infant with gastroschisis, which is a, a birth defect of the belly abdominal wall where the bell belly's a where the baby's intestines are actually outside of that belly. Um, and ultimately, the result of this was statistically insignificant. Now, you'll see that that will be a common theme among the developmental malformations outcomes studies. Uh, here we have the three studies from the neurodevelopmental effects side. Similarly, you'll see that same pattern with the study participants in the cases from glyphosate, that small percentage uh, of cases coming from that participant. Well, from the exposure matrix side, you'll see that one of the studies was an interview and two of the studies were GIS geocoding based. Also, here's a snapshot of one of those neurodevelopmental studies. It was from the Roll et al. study. Uh, it was a case control study with 45 cases associated with glyphosate. This image here shows a picture of an infant with a neural tube defect. Uh, and what was cool about this study was the fact that two results came out of it. A single, an, an odds ratio for a single pesticide model and an odds ratio for a multiple pesticide model. The single pesticide model for this study was looking at the sole association between glyphosate and the neural tube defect. While for the multiple pesticide model, it was looking at glyphosate with another, uh, with another pesticide that that individual participant was exposed to based off of the GIS geocoding. Uh, so ultimately, the single pesticide model was statistically significant, while the multiple pesticide model was not. Uh, here's a quick rundown of my results. Uh, out of all six studies, actually only two of them were statistically significant, and the three studies from the neurodevelopmental side, two of those studies were, so two of the three from the neurodevelopmental side were, while zero of the four from the developmental malformation side were not. So at this point, I was able to kind of just throw out all the developmental malformations outcome for any further research and kind of, you know, focus a little more so on the, the neuro side. Here's a quick risk of bias assessment. Uh, for my exposure assessment, that's kind of where I want to lead your guys' eyes towards. Uh, I recognize that four of the six studies had a probably high risk of bias. This is due to the fact that the, the self-reporting measures that they utilized, so things like interviews and, and forms, uh, even the GIS geocoding wasn't a great way of assessing exposure as it was only a surrogate indicator for maternal residential exposure. Uh, so as for my quality of evidence, I rated a low quality of evidence for developmental malformation studies. 
the four of them, while a moderate for the neurodevelopmental effects studies. This was due to three reasons. Uh, first of which was a large shift was observed among two of the three studies. Uh, limited sample size again when assessing glyphosate. And the fact that the strength of evidence could change uh, with an increase in studies later on, because there were only three studies that, that really looked at this association. Ultimately, with any systematic review, you'll have limitations. Uh, I recognize that you know, there was an, in, an inaccurate assessment of exposure, uh, whether that was through the forms or the interviews, or even the geocoding, like I mentioned. Um, also, the fact that out of actually all six studies, they assessed exposure as a dichotomous variable, so whether participants were either exposed or unexposed. And this raises a lot of variability as to what that necessarily means to be exposed, right? So you can have a, one participant at a lower exposed level than another participant at a, at a higher exposed level. And, you know, the, the lack of consistency among endpoints was also a big question of concern. Out of actually two, two, about two of the six studies had the same endpoint with neural tube defects and the other four did not. But the biggest thing I want to say is the fact that no biomonitoring was done. Um, I did a little more research after, my, after the conclusion of the systematic review, and I found that some glyphosate studies um, that looked at other endpoints, but they utilized things like urine samples, and that would be a great way as a, as a continuous variable to, to kind of go on from there, have a more accurate uh, assessment of exposure, and also to extrapolate that dose-response relationship for further on research. So I'll leave you guys with this. Further research that needs to be done, obviously a lot more studies, cohort studies, case control studies, increasing that uh, assessment of exposure, uh, increasing the statistical power, and ultimately, like, if there is an association being seen between glyphosate and neurodevelopmental effects studies, uh, A, I would love a peace prize, just kidding, but B, I, would, I think that implementing a glyphosate exposure ban is important, considering that it is the most widely used pesticide in the world today, and even focusing on a, on a substitute pesticide may be warranted. So I'd just like to acknowledge Dr. Perry as being my mentor, Dr. Price for being a lovely professor for this year. Um, all the health parts that have, the breath works was a pain, uh, and all of you guys. Mm -hmm. We're in awe. Yeah. <laughs> So I have a question about, um, I guess, the population. So you're looking at developmental effects. And so the studies that you were looking at um, in terms of exposure, you were, you're talking about exposures to the maternal exposures or exposures? So maternal exposures. Right. Okay. Maternal or paternal exposures, right. Okay. Yeah. And then in terms of um, your suggestion about there needing to be more biomonitoring um, as a better way to be able to access exposures. What would be some of the limitations of, of using a study that's solely um, focusing on biomonitoring as a way to be able to assess exposures to Roundup? Yeah. Roundup, uh, I mean, at first, I, I think that going about what biomonitoring tools you'll use is important to, to kind of identify in the first place. I mean, think, looking at like blood samples, I don't think that would be an ethical way of going about this. I mean, getting a blood sample from, from either a pregnant mother, uh, that would kind of raise a lot of questions of concern. Uh, but some limitations besides that, I mean, I don't, cost. Uh, but from a research standpoint, I feel like that would be a much better tool considering what they actually used for this case. I mean, assessing glyphosate through through a lot of uh, a lot of tools such as like interviews and forms introduces a lot of biases like recall bias um, uh, as well as selective reporting. So I don't really know of anything else besides that, but um, I think that would be a much better way. Besides, obviously, looking at blood samples, that would kind of be an ethical limitation. Yeah. Did any of the studies talk about formulations, meaning you have glyphosate, which is the active ingredient, but you have different ways of different commercial brands, or were all using Roundup? They were all using Roundup, right? Okay. Right, right, right. Yeah. Did you read anything about... On, on other forms of... Form right, that, or... I, I couldn't... No, I didn't find anything that looked upon that, really. Um, but... Cool. Thank you. But, but that could have probably been due to the fact that I... In, in, my search, in my search terms, I included like terms such as glyphosate and Roundup, uh, as well as like the actual molecular formula of itself. Um, so maybe that could have something.